to where we are continuing the series we started just a few weeks ago titled The Full Armor of God. And, and again, this, this series is titled The Full Armor because we need every piece of the armor. And, and there are many different pieces described uh, in Ephesians chapter 6. And again, that is our, our base uh, passage and text for this series as we're, we're studying each of the different pieces. But again, we started um, the very first week and just looking at at the letter of Ephesians, and, and what does it speak to? And uh, it is a New Testament letter, just like a lot of the New Testament is. It was, you know, letters that were written to specific people or specific churches or, or communities. And, and the, Ephesians is exactly like that. It's a letter that was written to a church in the town of Ephesus. Um, but the letter of Ephesians is a little bit different than most of the other New Testament letters because most of them address specific situations or problems or people or things that were going on in those communities. Um, the letter to the Ephesians speaks not to necessarily specific situations, but some bigger picture concepts about who God is and about how he wants to use the church, again, to expand his kingdom. And, and so we see these um, several different big picture purposes that God has for the church throughout this letter. And the final topic that Paul addresses in this letter to the Ephesians um, is the, the topic of spiritual warfare. Um, he addresses, again, how we as the church are on the front lines of a great spiritual conflict. And we see, again, we don't get to choose if we're a part of this war. Just because we are made in God's image and we are human means that we are a part of it. Um, but yet, he, had, he identifies for us who the real enemy is and what this, this war really looks like. And also then how we can stand firm in the midst of it. And just uh, our, our theme verses for this series comes out of Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11, where it says, A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Again, we, we know that when there is this cosmic battle that is in place, okay, he tells us who the real enemy is. Again, it's not, it's not other people. It's not other churches. It's not our culture. In fact, it's not this world at all. The real enemy is the devil and the powers of evil. Okay, and again, this is a spiritual war. It is one that is not fought physically, but yet it is fought spiritually. And as we fight, we are not to fight not on our own power, but to fight with God's power, because the end is already written, right? And the enemy is going to lose, because God wins. And but yet we have to fight again with God's power and on God's side. And, and again, we start we, we, again, start fighting back when we receive Christ as our Savior and, and receive the Holy Spirit and all the power that comes with that. And then as we fight back and through that, we put on all of God's armor. We need every piece of the armor in order to stand firm because they're all connected, right? They all are, uh, one strengthens the other. And, and uh, so again, our, our base text for today uh, is it comes out of Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 18, which is where Paul describes each of these different pieces um, and, and, and the spiritual attributes that go with each piece. And so we're going to read that this morning. So if you have your own Bible with you, I invite you to open with me to Ephesians chapter 6. If you don't have your own Bible or have it with you today, there are Bibles uh, in the seats that you're uh, welcome to use. And you'll notice on the outline is the page numbers of where you can find this passage in those Bibles. So we're going to read verses 13 through 18, again, where he describes all these different pieces of the armor. So Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 13. It says, Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor, so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. And then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. And in addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. As we see, again, Paul describes these, these different pieces of the armor, and, and again, we see this, this illustration of, of, 
of a Roman officer in the armor that he would put on and, and that prepares them for the duty of whatever it is, whether it's a battle or just, you know, standing guard or whatever it was, they would put on this armor to prepare themselves for whatever was ahead of them. And, and Paul lists these pieces of the armor in a very specific order. He, he lists them in the order that the soldier would put them on. And then, again, describes the, these different attributes that go with each piece. And so we started, um, again, with the belt of truth, the very first thing described. And, and we saw in that week of how the belt is, is, it ties everything together. It holds everything in place. And it's, it's where we start. We start with truth. And then we move from truth and that, is, that, that kind of keeps everything else in line. And then last week we looked at the breastplate of righteousness. And again, this breastplate is, is where it, it is the last line of defense to keep us alive. Right? If all else fails, if we start to, to lose the battle, whatever it is, then that, that armor, that breastplate will protect our vital organs and keep us alive. And we saw again last week, as we look at that, that, that righteousness that comes from God are, are like the guardrails on, a ro- on the road of life, right? They, they, they tell us where the boundaries are because God is God and he gets to make the rules, right? And, and they show us where, where the edges are and, and they, they protect us, right? If everything else goes wrong, those guardrails keep us on the right path, right? And they, they will keep our faith alive, just like that armor protects the soldier and keeps them alive. And then we move to today, we get to the shoes of peace. Now, we look at this and we're wondering, like, are shoes really a big deal when it comes to armor? Is that really, is that really a big deal? Why is this included in this? And the truth is that, that shoes really are a big deal. If you've ever been, like, gone on a big hike or, or gone on, uh, you know, a, a, even a if you're a big runner, right, or whatever, like, the, the number one rule is to always protect your feet, okay, and to keep them healthy. Now, um, the, the Roman warrior would have worn footwear in two different pieces, okay? The first piece was their sandals, okay, and it, this is just a, an example of a typical Roman sandal that, the, that the, the warriors would have worn. Again, it's made of leather, and it kind of straps onto their feet, but the most important part is that sole. Okay, and it protects the bottom of their feet as they go through the varying terrain. And, and again, I was just about a month ago, was in the Holy Land and saw that in that area of the world, that the terrain varies dramatically. Okay, and no matter where the Roman soldier would go, and again, the, Rome had a presence all, and all over many different landscapes. And so they would give their soldiers these shoes to protect their feet. But also notice on the bottom are these, the, they had brads or metal pieces stuck into the bottom. Okay, and these would give them extra traction. Okay, and to where no matter what terrain they got into, they would, they would have a firm foundation right, under their feet. Again, these sandals would, would enable the warrior to be able to travel quicker, to go farther in a day, and to maintain their physical health of their feet, which was very, very important for them. Okay, the, the second piece that, that was a part of kind of their footwear um, are known as greaves. And these are uh, just some examples of some, uh, some that were found in some excavations. Okay, and these, again, would go on the, above the sandals, right on top of them, and protect their lower legs. These are very similar to what we would see today as like shin guards in soccer. Right now, these, just like, uh, just like we saw with the breastplate, Last week is these very widely in far as how fancy they are, even what they're made of. Um, and again, the, the higher rank you are, the more wealthy you, w- you were, the fancier your greaves would be. And again, this is an example of some pretty fancy ones. And these ones were, had engravings on them. And these were made of metal, right, which is obviously stronger. But the normal, everyday infantry warrior and soldier in the Roman army, theirs would have been made of leather. Right? But they would wear them, and even some of them would even wear them on their arms to protect, you know, on their forearms in a similar fashion. Right? But we have these two pieces. We have these sandals and these greaves. And, and again, not only do these, do these, these provide uh, for the warrior to, to protect their feet and their legs to help them travel quicker, farther, and to maintain their physical health, but these shoes would also improve their balance and agility in battle. Right, and when we think about how important is your feet in a battle, they are incredibly important. 
Okay, because it provides, again, the foundation for you to be able to stand. And that's exactly what we are told to do in this war, to stand firm. Right? And without your feet, then you're not standing at all. Right? In fact, if, if you can take out your opponent's feet, right, then they're a lot easier to defeat because right? they're on the ground. Right? And they can't fight back. Now, again, this is the same concept we see even today in our modern culture um, in sports. And you see this, and it doesn't matter what sport you're playing, okay, is that your footwork is incredibly important. Okay? And now, again, whether it's the baseball swing, whether it's the, where you plant your foot to kick the soccer ball, right, whether it's, it's where you're at football, I'll tell you one, one sports that I take very seriously is the golf swing. Okay? And in the golf swing, like how you place your feet and how far away they are and all those kind of things is how you make different shots in golf, right? The difference is how you set your feet, and it changes your entire golf swing. Okay, the same is true in many other sports. In fact, as, as some of you know, I coach I coached my boys in football, and, and especially in football, when you look, whether they're a lineman or a linebacker on defense or offense, their footwork is so incredibly important. In fact, the difference between a good quarterback and, and an exceptional quarterback is how they move their feet, right, and how they throw. Again, a lot of their success is not necessarily on the strength of their arm or even in what they see, although those are very important, right, but again, if you watch a really good quarterback, the way they drop back when they get the, get the ball, the way that they throw off of their feet is, is a, makes huge differences in how successful they are. Okay, our feet and our footwork are incredibly important. Okay, whether you're in battle or in sports or whatever it would be, right, and Paul knew this and he saw this, that you need a strong foundation to be successful. And when we see this, again, we, we understand, okay, we, we understand the importance of our feet and about the strong foundation, but, but where does peace come in? Why is that the foundation? And, and yet we look at our world's definition of peace, right? And the world's definition is the absence of conflict, right? The absence of conflict is saying that it's, it's peaceful. In fact, we, we know it's, it's almost kind of a running joke in our world, right? Like e every beauty pageant contestant knows the right answer is world peace, Right? But it's so much more than that. In fact, the biblical definition of peace, okay, within the Bible, peace is not just a physical reality, not just the absence of conflict, but peace is highly relational. It, it has everything to do with our relationships, not just the absence of conflict, right, that we are not fighting, but yet is what is the status of our relationship? with God and with other people. In fact, we see this even uh, through the, the Old Testament Hebrew word that is translated as peace is the word shalom. Again, this is a very common greeting among, you know, Hebrew nation. In fact, it's still used now all the time. It's a common greeting. Shalom is kind of a hello and a goodbye. It's the aloha, right, of, uh, of the Hebrew nation. In fact, when I was in the Holy Land, in every, you know, souvenir shop, there were all these plaques and signs and everything that said, had shalom all over it. Hey, but it literally means peace. It's a very common greeting. In fact, uh, it's one that not only in Old Testament times, but even in the New Testament, we see all these New Testament letters, many of them open the letter and close the letter with a reference to peace. Right? It is still a common greeting, right? Peace be with you. And as we realize this, we see, again, the relational nature of peace. It goes far beyond just the absence of conflict, right? It has a very relational tone. To expand the definition even further, as we see, again, the, the biblical definition, it's, it's not just highly relational, but it's also the state of completion, especially the completion of God's plan or, or God fulfilling his promises, Right, again, when we find, are we at peace, right, or have we found our peace with God, right, and that is all based on, has God fulfilled his promises in our lives, right, has God's plan been fulfilled, has it played out in our lives? Again, the, the strongest emphasis on biblical peace is between the relationship between us and God, between humans and the divine. 
Okay, again, we've all kind of heard that phrase, and we kind of use it in, even in our culture of, have you made peace with God? Are you at peace with God? Right? And what that really means is saying, is your relationship at a good place? Right? Or is there strife, or is there something between you and God? Right? And if there is, then we need to make peace. Right? We need to be reconnected. It's highly relational, not just the absence of conflict. Hey, we see then in, in Ephesians 6.15, the, the verse, again, that the focus is on the shoes and on peace. is for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. Now, Paul teaches us two very distinct things about peace in this verse. Okay, we understand it's our shoes, it's our foundation, it's going to affect, you know, everything else. It's going to, it's, it's literally our ability to stand firm, which is what we are supposed to do in this war. But the two important things that Paul teaches us in this verse about peace, the first is where peace comes from. Okay, what is the source of peace? It says that the peace comes from the good news. Right, notice in this verse, good news is capitalized. It is a noun. Okay, and because the word here is the word that's translated as good news is gospel. Again, what is the source of it? It is the gospel. Okay, we're going to dive into that here in just a minute. But before we do that, I'll tell you the second thing that peace, that we learn about peace from this verse, okay, is the result of peace. What, what, what is the result? If we have peace in our life, what is the result? The result is that we are fully prepared. Okay, so again, we're going to get to that here a little later. So we're going to start here for this first thing. Where does peace come from? Peace comes from the good news. So what we need to know and, and, and live through and, and live out in our lives is that true peace is found through the gospel of Jesus. True peace is found through the gospel of Jesus. Again, this word gospel is literally translated as good news as we see in this verse. But again, what, what does that mean? Well, uh, first off is that the gospel, that word gospel stands for the story of Jesus' life, right? The story of the Messiah, Okay, when we look at, even in our, the way our Bible is arranged and, and of the different books that are, that are in it, we have all of the Old Testament books, and then, and then we have the, the New Testament starts with the four Gospels, right? The four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that tell us about the life of Jesus, right? And then we move on from the Gospels into the New Testament letters, right? After we have the Acts of the Apostles, then we have all of the letters, and then it ends with Revelation. Hey, but uh, the, again, the center of the Bible and the center of what is supposed to be all of our lives is the gospel, the story of Jesus, because that is where true peace comes from. It comes from the gospel of Jesus. That is our source. Again, what was the Messiah sent to earth to do? Hey, in fact, Jesus was very clear on his purpose. He, he came to restore peace or to have a ministry of reconciliation to reconcile humans with god to fix our broken relationship again peace is highly relational right? in fact jesus said says many times that he has the ministry of reconciliation right his mission was to restore peace Again, peace is about restoring the broken relationship between a sinful man and a holy God. And we see, therefore, and there right again, how it's connected to righteousness that we looked at last week. All right, so again, we see it, it starts here with the Messiah. And in fact, the Old Testament, all the Old Testament looks forward to the Messiah. In fact, there's many prophecies in the Old Testament that predicted the Messiah coming and, and accomplishing his mission. One of these famous prophecies in the Old Testament look, that look forward to the Messiah is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. This is a passage we oftentimes read at Christmas time. Okay, when you see Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, it says, For a child is born to us. A son is given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And his government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. If we look at this prophecy and see that, again, peace was at the center of the Messiah's mission. 
Right, again, there's several different names of Messiah that is described here, and, and yet Prince of Peace is right there. Right, and yet we also can, can see that, again, the commonly held expectation of the coming Messiah, of those that, that read and studied these prophecies, was that the Messiah was going to be a military leader. Right, just like David was, right? And David ruled all of Jerusalem and, and ruled as a military leader. And that, that was and still is the expectation that many have of the Messiah even today. Those that do not believe that Jesus was the, the fulfillment of the Messiah. They're still looking for a military leader, right? That will rule the whole earth. As, as again, you can see where they get that out of this prophecy. Right, but yet we also see later in Isaiah, we see this other, another prophecy about the coming Messiah as it was looking forward to Jesus in Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6. It says, but, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away, and we have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. And we see what was the, the real mission of the Messiah was to pay for all of our sin. Not just our sin, but all of creation's sin. Right, again, what, what was God's plan? The completion of God's plan, right, was, was to make us whole. Right, to restore our relationship with a holy God. In fact, I, I encourage you on, on your outline in this, in, this, uh, in this verse to circle the phrase, could be whole. Again, that was the mission of the Messiah. And I want you to, to circle that phrase because in this NLT translation of this verse, right, it translates it as, so we could be whole. But in other translations, okay, this same phrase is translated as peace. In fact, if you have a King James Bible or a New King James Bible, it, literally this verse, that phrase is translated as peace. He was beaten so we can be at peace. And that, again, shows us the biblical definition of what peace really is, right? Of us being made whole because we were created for a, a relationship with our God. And we are not whole without it. Right? When we see, again, this this peace of the Messiah came, then we saw all through Scripture, again, in several different places, when around the, the, the birth of Jesus, and um, we see peace that is declared by many different people. In Luke 2.14, in Zechariah, who was the father of John the Baptist, when John the Baptist is born, he was, he was praising God about not just the son, but for the, the role that his son would play, and, you know, leading the way for the Messiah. And, Ze and Zechariah talks about the peace that will come through the Messiah. In Luke chapter 1, when the, when the angels show up to the shepherds in the field, right, they declare that peace has arrived. Right, in fact, in Luke chapter 2, they, when Mary and Joseph take Jesus into the temple and have him dedicated in the temple, Simeon, right, who dedicates Jesus, says that my, I can now die in peace because I have seen the Messiah. Right, we see again this peace surrounding the, 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 the Christ child. And then even later in his life, Jesus himself in John 14, 27, says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Again, this is where he's explaining to his disciples. He's like, hey, a whole bunch of this stuff's about to go down. I'm going to die. Okay, and I'm going to be leaving you. But I'm not leaving you forever. I'm going to leave a gift with you. Right? And what was that gift? Peace. Right? It was the Messiah fulfilling his mission, right? his ministry of reconciliation. Because peace is highly relational. I mean, we see how the Old Testament looks forward to the cross. We see, again, even Jesus' own claims of, of giving us peace. And then we see in the New Testament letters that look backwards at the cross. We see in Romans 5.1 where it says, Therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Again, how do we find peace? What is the source of peace? The source of peace is the gospel. 
right, of receiving Christ as our Savior and, and receiving his grace and confessing of our sins so they can be paid for by, by the death and resurrection and blood of Jesus so that we can have that unhindered, reconciled relationship with our creator, right? And that is the source of peace. And then we see the second thing that, that Paul teaches us then in this verse about peace and about these shoes that were supposed to be put on, and that is the fact that this peace then fully prepares us for whatever is ahead. Right, so we start, we find peace through the gospel, and then, then it prepares us so that we can move forward. Because So that's, again, the second thing we need to learn is that without peace, I am unprepared for battle, and I will be easily tripped up. Without peace, I'm unprepared for battle, and I will be easily tripped up. Again, shoes enable the warrior to, to travel quicker, farther, and to maintain their physical health. These shoes improve their balance and agility in battle, and the same is true for us. As we, this peace will prepare us for the spiritual battle that is ahead of us. Again, what, how does peace truly prepare me for this battle? What does it bring into my life? Okay, there's, there's three things I want to point out that we see scripturally of what peace will bring into our lives that will prepare us for whatever lies ahead. The first thing is that peace will bring unity. Okay, that peace will bring unity into our lives. If we see here at the beginning of, of Ephesians, of, the, of the, the beginning part of this letter in Ephesians chapter 2, um, Paul kind of lays the foundation for, for this, this peace as he as says that this is a, an incredible, important foundation in your life and in your faith and the unity that it will bring. Okay, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 and 16, he says, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people, when in his own body on the cross he broke the wall of hostility that separated us. Because together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on a cross. And our hostility towards each other was put to death. Again, what was he telling us about Christ is that he will unify the whole world together through the gospel. It says, again, he broke down the walls of hostility that separate us. Right? They're gone. They're not there anymore if we embrace the gospel. Now, I don't know what your reaction to this description is when you read it, but I know what I think when I read it, right, is that, man, we need these walls of hostility to be broken down as much today as we ever have. Right? Because it was very true then, right, when Paul wrote it, right, and it's still incredibly true today. Right, is that there are walls of hostility we have towards each other that need to be broken down. Right, and this is so incredibly true. I wish this was true of the church today in 2020, that we were not divided, but unfortunately, it's just not true. Right, it takes us, again, it takes us all the way back to the belt. Right, we need that truth. We need to be united in unity. Because instead of unity, we see division. Right? And yet, peace is supposed to bring unity to us. And what is the unifying factor? It is Jesus Christ. It is the gospel. Right? And even if we disagree on different details, we should always be unified on Christ. Because he is, again, the prince of peace. Right, so, again, peace is supposed to bring unity into our lives, to, to strengthen our foundation. The, the second thing that, that peace brings into our life is that peace will bring acceptance and comfort beyond understanding. It will bring acceptance and comfort that is beyond our understanding. At first, we start here, we look at Philippians 4, 6, and 7, where it tells us, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Worry or pray. He says, so tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. And then you will experience God's peace, right, which exceeds anything we can understand. 
then his peace will guard our hearts and our minds as we live in Christ Jesus. He says, as we live in the gospel, we live out the gospel every day of our life, right? And when we live out the gospel, right, what will we find? We will find peace, and it will guard our minds and our hearts. And we see that, that again, that peace is supposed to, to, to bring us to a place of acceptance instead of confusion, right? Because, we, again, we find, we find that peace, right, through prayer instead of worry. I mean, because what is worry? Worry is me, you know, not, not trusting, is, is worrying about what might happen, right? And that worry oftentimes comes out of confusion, I'm like not understanding what's happening or knowing where I'm going, right? Because this might happen or that might happen or this, whatever, right? That's where worry comes from, is uncertainty. But yet, as we're told here, to pray, we'll find, as we connect our soul with God's through prayer, right, we, we find this acceptance from God that brings the peace, because it's saying, yeah, you know what, no matter what happens, it's okay, because I'm, God's with me, right, and so I can accept whatever happens, I don't have to worry about it, right, and so that acceptance counteracts our confusion and our worry, and then also, though, it brings us comfort, I can comfort about, I, I, can, I can relax in the situation, right? I don't have to worry about it, right? I'm because I'm comfortable. And I can find comfort instead of, instead of turmoil and confrontation. I can find comfort. Both of these things, acceptance instead of confusion and worry, comfort instead of turmoil and confrontation, both of these things, again, do not make any sense on a human level. How can I find these things in this situation? It makes no sense. Which is exactly what he tells us, right? Is that this peace will exceed anything you can understand. Don't even try and figure it out because you won't be able to. Right? Because if it's coming from God, again, the source of that peace is the gospel. It won't make sense on the human level. Right? And it will, it will make everybody else who doesn't have the gospel of peace wonder how on earth can you respond that way? I would be freaking out. I say, yeah, what's the difference? The difference is Christ. Here we see peace brings unity. Peace brings comfort and acceptance beyond understanding. And then pre peace also brings hope into our life. It brings hope. In John 16, 33, the words of Jesus is Jesus tells us the truth about this world we live in. He says, I've told you all this so you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Again, he says, I, I'm come. What, is, what does he want to give us in our life? He wants to give us peace. Again, Jesus tells the truth, right? If He said, hey, if you follow me, it's, your life is not going to be perfect. In fact, he guarantees us that we are going to have trials and sorrows. But, we're facing it with Jesus, not on our own. Again, we're fighting with God's power, not our own. Right? And why, do, why does that bring hope for me? Even in the midst of my present circumstances, I can still have hope because he's overcome the world. He's overcome the evil. He wins in the end. And I can find hope instead of discouragement. Again, hope is focused on or hope isn't focused on my present circumstances, but on what is to come. On the fact that I'm not stuck in my present circumstances, but it will all be made right by God in the end. Again, do my present circumstances stink? Yes. Is it frustrating when underhanded schemes and dishonest people seem to win out? Absolutely. But I find hope in those times because justice is the Lord's, not mine. He wins in the end. He has overcome all of it, which is why we're supposed to fight with his power, not my own. Again, as we look over all of these things, right, this is exactly where the enemy attacks. He attacks us at the foundation. 
Right? And this is a huge part of the, the strategy of the enemy against us as God's people and as the church. Again, his strategy is to divide God's people instead of unify, to create chaos and misunderstanding, to create confusion, and to focus us on the present and not on the big picture, which makes us hopeless and discouraged instead of empowered and full of peace. When peace is disrupted, we end up fighting each other instead of fighting the real enemy. It creates divisions in the church, and we are a lot easier to take out one by one than when we are united together. So how do we find peace? How do we find peace as a church? How do we, how do we fight together? How do we really stand firm? Right, there, there's a couple ways we see within Scripture I want to leave you with today of, of how do you find true peace in my journey. Okay, the first one is this, is the first step towards peace is about your relationship with God. It starts with the gospel. It is the source of our peace, and it starts with, are you at peace with God? And have you received Christ as your Savior? Right? Have you invited him in your life? Have you confessed your sins and received his grace and forgiveness? And has your relationship with God been restored? Have you received salvation? Have you opened your life to Jesus? Is the Holy Spirit living in your heart? Because until you do that, you're fighting on your own power. Right? And you're going to lose. The first step about peace is between you and God. It doesn't affect anyone else. It's between you and him. Right? In 1 Peter 3.11, Peter tells us, he says, turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. As we look at this, this short verse, but yet this powerful verse, right? First off, he tells us to turn away from evil, meaning you got to deal with the sin in your own life, right? And that starts with you receiving Christ as your Savior for the first time. Deal with your sin. But that's also a very important part of our ongoing transformation journey, after you receive Christ, as a follower of Jesus, you have to continue to deal with the sin in your own life and your own heart. Right? Is turn away from evil. And instead, as you turn from evil, then turn towards good. Right? Which connects us back to the righteousness we looked at last week. Right? The second thing he tells us to do in this verse is to search for peace. Search for it. Fight for it. Do anything you have to do to find peace. Because again, Jesus even calls us to be a peacemaker, not a peacekeeper. And those are two very different things, by the way. A peacemaker or a peacekeeper. It's not just about avoiding conflict, but it's about addressing what really needs to be addressed so you can find real peace. Again, Jesus modeled for us what it means to be a peacemaker. Right? Again, Jesus was the Prince of Peace. But he also made a whip and brought a sword into different situations. Okay, and then the third thing that we're told to do in this verse is to then work to maintain peace. Right? And we need to understand that this is not an issue we can ever be lazy with. Right? We always have to focus on our feet and focus on our foundation. Right? We cannot get lazy. Because if we get lazy, then the enemy takes out our feet and we're not standing at all. We have to keep it in the forefront of our mind. We have to live out the gospel every day. All right, the second thing then that we, that we do to find peace, first it starts between you and God, and the second thing is it's about your relationship with other people. All right, it's about your relationship with other people. Hebrews 12, 14 and 15 tells us to work at living in peace with everyone and work out of living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Again, we see this, right? We're told to, to not only watch out for our own peace, but also watch out for others. Right? And, and we need to work together again in unity to make sure that, that we all have that peace and live in peace with everyone. 
Again, what, what, what is it that divides? It starts with, with being offended or, or anger about a situation. And, and if those things are not addressed, right, then they grow into an attitude of bitterness. Again, the, literally, this, this phrase that is used here is, is that it's a poisonous root of bitterness. And notice that bitterness not only affects you, but it corrupts many. Right? Because that bitterness is contagious. Right? And that bitterness will, will, will go out from you and, and affect many people around you. Right? Which will then disrupt peace further. Right? So first, we find peace through God. It's between you and God. And secondly, we have to maintain peace through me with other people. Because peace is highly relational. And it is the foundation that helps us to stand firm. Without it, we will be taken out, and we won't be standing at all. And this is the final thought this morning, and that's this, that biblical peace focuses on relationships. And without it, the very foundation of your faith is at risk. Are you at peace with God and with other people? Again, I don't know what your life looks like. I don't know what, where your faith journey is. I don't know if you're at peace or you're not at peace. Right? But God does know where you are. Right, And I just encourage you, wherever you are in your life, whatever you need to do to bring peace into your life, deal with it today, right now, before you leave. God, we praise you for that today, that we are saved, again, by the Prince of Peace. God, that we find peace through the gospel, the way of salvation. And Lord, I pray that we would all find peace in our own hearts and our own minds today. God, that we would be united through your spirit, God, that we would not worry, God, that, that again, we would be stand firm no matter what we face. God, that we can stand firm on our feet because we have your peace. A peace that, that we can't even explain, but that comes from you. And God, I pray that as we go this week and as we continue to fight this battle, God, that our foundation would be strong and firm. God, that your peace would reign in our hearts and in our minds. And God, that you would restore relationships. God, that you would show this world a peace that, that they don't even understand to where we can explain it to them. Say, you know what's different in my life? It's the gospel. God, help us to take new ground for you as we fight this battle with a firm foundation, with our feet steady under us. We love you. We praise you. Guide us as we go this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.